They fly through the air on broomsticks. They cast spells, conjuring both good and evil. They can be hideous and frightening, or sassy, seductive, and downright sexy. Witches are a mainstay in Western pop culture. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. But jokes and entertainment aside, being labeled a witch can still get you killed. Imagine you find out your ancestor was a witch. At least, they said she was a witch. Apparently, she poisoned people. Someone even said she could fly. So she was tried and burned as a witch. That's what happened in my family history. So let me take you on a journey to learn all about witch hunts. And don't think for one minute that they're over. I was a teenager when I found out about my ancestor, Margarita Kröber, how over 300 years ago in 1642, she was accused, tried, tortured, and ultimately burned as a witch. For years, I was haunted by her story and wanted to find out what really happened. So I traveled to Winningen, a small town in southwestern Germany, its wine country, surrounded by an idyllic patchwork of sloping hills and vineyards. But one of those hills is a mass grave. In the 17th century, more than 20 people died here during the Winningen witch trials. Their names are etched into Germany's oldest monument to persecuted witches. And this is actually the place where the witches were burned. This is the execution place. And if we come over here, I've been up here several times with my family, and we always came up to see our ancestor, Margarita Kröber. So what kind of a woman was she? And why was she accused of witchcraft? To find out, I tracked down local historian Walter Rummel. He knows the details of every witch trial in this area, including that of my ancestor. She was an interesting woman, because a lot of clues indicate she was very clever, that she had a deep sense of responsibility but that this inner strength and confidence probably meant she overstepped her boundaries a bit with regard to others in the community. Sounds like she was a bit of a rebel, someone who didn't quite toe the line of social norms, and possibly a bit before her time. Margarita came from a well-to-do family and married a judge, so she belonged to the town's social elite. She was the mother of two small boys when the accusations against her grew rife. Here in the church, she suffered a mortifying attack of dysentery in front of the entire congregation. Later, her accusers said that Satan had followed her into the sacred space. It was just one of many charges, including allegedly giving various people food or drink in the past, after which they'd become gravely ill. In the state archives in nearby Koblenz, the original records of the Winning and Rich trials are extraordinarily well preserved. And with Walter's help, I make a shocking discovery. It turns out Margarita's own mother was burned as a witch before her. In fact, Maria Knebel was the first person in Winningen to be executed for witchcraft, already in 1631. So poor Margarita already had the cards stacked against her. But when did this witch hunt craze actually begin? And why? Demonology as a science has existed since the beginning of theological thinking. Christian and theological teaching grappled with these questions from the start. Already the Old Testament had it in for witches in the book of Exodus, which states, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. But it was Thomas of Aquinas, a 13th century Dominican friar and theologian, who had a profound impact on the church's view of witchcraft. He argued the world was full of evil demons and that witches were practitioners of malevolent sorcery. According to him, women were not only particularly susceptible to demonic possession, but were lining up to make a pact, even to have sex with the devil himself. He was backed up by Pope John XXII in 1326 
who declared any practice of magic to be an act of heresy. After that, the church went whole hog to warn people of this new threat. These ideas led to the definition of a new criminal offense, witchcraft, and laid the groundwork for the great European witch hunts. By the 15th century, this brand of fake news was spreading like wildfire in the form of the Maleus Maleficarum, or the Hammer of Witches, by Dominican Inquisitor Heinrich Kramer. First published in 1486, it was essentially the manual on how to identify, try, torture, and kill witches. Kramer described in obsessive detail how witches make their lustful pact with the devil, renounce their Christian faith, eat children, and generally wreak havoc on their surroundings. A book full of toxic masculine obsessions coincided with the rise of the printing press, meaning its message could travel far and fast. Over the next 200 years, the Maleos sold like hotcakes, becoming second only to the Bible in terms of sales. Images gave form to these ideas as seminal works like these 15th century woodcuts inspired many artists, like German painter and printmaker Albrecht Dürer, and his student, Hans Baldung Green, whose interpretations of deviant, devilish women were pretty salacious stuff and continued to inspire the public imagination through the ages, right on into the 20th century, like here in the 1922 cult horror film, Hexon. All this hit a nerve as early modern Europe was fraught with problems, invasions, wars of religion, new illnesses like syphilis, even a climate crisis. From the early 14th to mid 19th century, much of Northern Europe was in the grip of a big chill known as the Little Ice Age that meant years of crop failure, extreme weather, and economic hardship. People got the idea that witches were responsible for all of this, that out of greed, envy, and resentment, they were in league with the devil and using malevolent magic to create this weather chaos. It was, quite literally, a perfect storm. Witches offered Europe's beleaguered populations a simple explanation for widespread famine, sickness, and suffering. And that's when witch hunts really took off. Contemporary historians estimate that between 50 and 60,000 people died as a result of the European witch trials and about 80% of the victims were women. About half of those victims, or 25,000 people, were killed within the boundaries of present-day Germany. Which brings us back to Margarete, whose ordeal was pretty typical for the time. She was denounced and arrested, her body searched for an incriminating devil's mark. They shaved off all her hair, but she refused to confess, so the witch commission resorted to torture, a legal policy at the time. Anyone who was accused was assumed to be guilty and the person had to prove their own innocence. The idea was that the confession was inherently there, just under the surface, and had to be drawn out. Torture was seen as a necessary means of killing off the body to free the soul, to allow it to feel remorse and to confess. Margarita was strapped into the iron boot, an instrument designed to slowly crush the lower leg. When she still maintained her innocence, they hoisted her up by her hands with a rope. Out of her mind with pain, she was forced to denounce another woman, a common practice that led to more witch trials and kept the brutal cycle going. After two days, she could stand no more and confess to being a witch, sealing her own death sentence. The trial records revealed much more about my family and that even more relatives were victims of the witch hunts. Here in the nearby town of Castellaun, in this freezing dungeon, one of them was imprisoned for weeks. His family fought in vain to save him. Wait a minute, him? You heard right. And in fact, nearly one in four victims of the European witch hunts was a man, a detail that's often ignored. But wasn't it cunning women? midwives and healers who were most likely to be accused of witchcraft? This midwife myth has incredible longevity. 
that church and state colluded to go after cunning women, healers and midwives and destroy their knowledge of birth control and abortion, that's not true at all. Rita and her colleagues agree that some of the most common myths about witch hunts have been perpetuated by feminist interpretations, where they fit perfectly into a political agenda. For decades, women's movements eager to rebel against patriarchal structures embraced the witch as a potent symbol of power, which she remains to this day in most of the Western world. She is this symbol of power that is subversive. She is a symbol of women being free and independent, getting justice, and so she is ultimately this really inspiring figure because nobody can keep her down. Back in 1642, a woman like that was certainly a provocation, but neither midwives nor red-haired women were more likely to be accused of witchcraft. In the end, it could happen to anyone. But back to Vinningen, such a seemingly peaceful little place. Why were 20 witches executed in this town alone? One explanation could be that as a wine-growing region, it was hit hard by the Little Ice Age. Did people here just need someone to blame for the hailstones that ruined their harvest? Or were there religious radicals at work? Who was actually on the local witch commission? Historian Walter Rummel says it was a group of local citizens eager to better their status a secular court that seized the opportunity to upend social power structures to its own advantage, and the victims' fortunes along with it. It was all about power, money, envy, and resentment. As a well-off family high up in the pecking order, it's no wonder Margarita was a target. Whereby we can clear up yet another misconception, that the Catholic Church was the driving force behind the European witch trials. The notion that Catholics hunted witches and Protestants were restrained doesn't hold any water. Indeed, after the Reformation, Vinningen was predominantly Protestant. And it turns out Protestant communities were often far more zealous in their persecution of witches than Catholic ones. In an area that converted to Protestantism in 1557, surrounded by the so-called wrong Catholic religion, they were under enormous pressure to prove that Protestantism was the better religion, the right religion. And that had quite an effect on the accusations. In fact, Protestant countries like Scotland and Sweden saw a much higher incidence of witch trials than Catholic-dominated Ireland or Portugal. Italy and Spain, both predominantly Catholic, were comparatively safe for anyone associated with witchcraft. The Roman Inquisition persecuted people for sorcery, magic and superstition, but they rarely put anyone to death. The Spanish Inquisition never executed witches because very early on they concluded that witches don't even exist. Another place where witch trials devastated a Protestant population was in Norway. The tiny town of Vardu saw one of the biggest witch trials in Scandinavia. An impressive monument commemorates the execution of 91 people for witchcraft back in 1621, nearly a third of the village at the time. My ancestor's story came to its tragic end in November 1642. Margarete Kröber was forced to address the townspeople who had gathered to witness her execution. As God is my witness, I beg anyone whom I may have wronged in my life for forgiveness. May I be an example to all, and I entreat all of you to keep God before thine eyes and shield yourselves from the evil enemy. She was granted a merciful death and was beheaded before her body was burned. Perhaps most shocking of all was the feeding frenzy that ensued. According to records, 250 litres of wine were hauled up to the execution site, a treacherous ploy to ensure the whole town was complicit. Margarita's husband was handed the bill. In short, witch trials were a lucrative business. Commissioners, scribes, vintners, executioners all made a handsome living, perpetuating the system. 
By the mid-1600s, Europe's witchcraft mania had made its way to the New World. The most famous witch trials began in Salem, Massachusetts in 1692. Of nearly 200 people accused of witchcraft, 19 were executed, one crushed to death, and at least five died in jail. So when did all this madness stop? As they counted their dead in Salem, witch hunting hysteria in Europe began to die down as people doubted so many could be guilty of witchcraft. The Age of Enlightenment gave more credence to science and reason than to superstitious beliefs. Food was more plentiful, and the advent of insurance meant people were less prone to disaster. The last alleged witch in Europe was beheaded in Switzerland in 1782, marking the end of a dark chapter. Well, thank God that's over. Or is it? There have never been so many witch hunts as we see in today's world. The words of witch hunt expert Wolfgang Beringer, whose research is a shocker. He says more people were killed for witchcraft in the 20th century than in the entire 300 years of European witch hunts. In fact, a recent global study shows that belief in witchcraft is still widespread today, and dozens of countries are affected. In the Pacific Island nation of Papua New Guinea, the public torture and murder of alleged witches is so common that Sorcery Accusation Related Violence, or SARV, has its own acronym. Most often the victims are women, and according to experts, their number is on the rise, especially in village and tribal communities. The UN estimates some 200 people are killed each year. Mm. There's a very high number of murders of alleged witches that go unreported in Papua New Guinea. You can read every week in the Times of India in which village witches have just been killed. Sometimes men, mostly women, who have been ostracized, outcast, and murdered by the village community, so to speak. It happens every week. In South Asia, women are still blamed for crop failure, disease or natural disasters, or frequently branded as witches for a trifle, like this woman from Jharkhand who offered medicine to a neighbor. The village elder took me captive. He made me eat feces. He beat me for so long they thought I was dead, but I was able to escape. When singled out, victims are often helpless in the face of mob dynamics. Single women and widows are particularly at risk, as they are in Africa, where the problem is rampant. If we look at recent times, then we see that in a country like Tanzania alone, since its independence in the early 60s, between 30 and 40,000 people, mostly women, have been killed for alleged crimes of witchcraft. Most likely found guilty by some kind of village tribunal and then killed by young people. And it's not just Tanzania. Many countries, including Nigeria or the Democratic Republic of Congo, are also dealing with the problem. In northern Ghana, hundreds of older women have been banished to segregated villages or witch camps. One of them is Gambaga. These women have been denounced for causing fires, drought and disease. Many were accused by their own families. Konjit Lambong had to flee her village after a neighbor accused her of witchcraft. She's been in Gambaga for 10 years. I was badly abused. My landlord asked me to vacate the property because of the witchcraft accusation. I also fled to stop the brutalities. Just look at my arm. This is what they did to me. It's broken. Nigerian human rights activist Leo Igwe has visited Gambaga for his research. For years, he's been fighting the persecution of witches throughout Africa and urging governments to protect the victims. His goal? That by 2030, witch hunts in Africa will be a thing of the past. The victims are mainly women, and let me tell you why. Women occupy a weaker social cultural position. African countries or African societies are organized around men. Women are treated as second-class human beings, as human beings that you can get rid of. 
In 2022, over 80 women were living in Gambaga, in squalid conditions, with no health care. They live from donations, selling firewood, or doing occasional work on surrounding farms. Illness, famine, floods or drought brought on by climate change. Despite the cultural divide, there are striking parallels between the witch hunts in Africa and those in early modern Europe. 80-year-old Ladi Winyani describes her ordeal. They stripped me naked, shaved me everywhere as part of the rituals, my private parts and my armpits. <laughs> Ghana's government is well aware of the witchcraft superstition and its often fatal consequences, yet has announced its intention to close all witch villages. Closing down the witch camp is like addressing symptoms. Again, the victims are being targeted. <laughs> Again, they are doubly victimized. They are forced to go back to communities. So the government of Ghana is approaching the problem wrongly, and that is why I think we have not seen any significant shift in terms of resolving the problem of witch persecution in Ghana. This is a battle that we have to win. We have to win it for Africa. We have to win it for humanity. Leo Igwe takes inspiration from two women who did win their battle, the activists for the Witches of Scotland. For two years, Claire Mitchell and Zoe Venditotsi campaigned for a legal pardon and apology for the 2,500 people, mostly women, convicted and executed for witchcraft in Scotland. Although their persecution dates back several centuries, they saw their demand as a signal for the present. There are still people across the world, generally vulnerable, often women or old people, that are being accused of witchcraft and in some cases being killed by mob justice. And in fact, there are some countries that are trying to put it into their legal system where people can still be accused of witchcraft. So we don't think that it's an issue that's passed. It's still sadly very, very relevant. On March 8th, 2022, their plea was heard. Scotland's then First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, acknowledged the historic injustice before Parliament. On behalf of the Scottish Government, I am choosing to acknowledge that egregious historic injustice and extend a formal posthumous apology to all those accused, convicted, vilified or executed under the Witchcraft Act of 1563. A signal to the rest of the world. Where at least in the West, witches and witchcraft are having something of a renaissance. New York-based Pam Grossman is a self-proclaimed witch, author, and host of the successful Witch Wave podcast. While exact numbers are elusive, she has observed the growing interest in witchcraft and paganism in recent years and puts it down to a need for alternatives in uncertain times. We see what is happening with capitalism being so ravenous and so bottomless that it is destroying the very planet that we live on. And so witchcraft is a beautiful alternative to all of that because witchcraft says that we all are divine, no matter what our gender or background is, we all have access to inner power. From spiritual connection to political and environmental activism, the shape-shifting witch has morphed and proliferated in popular culture and online. The witches of Instagram and videos with the hashtag witch talk amass millions of views as people find strength, balance, and community in modern interpretations of the craft. At the same time, the word witch continues to be used to defame strong women. The smear campaigns against Hillary Clinton prior to the 2016 US election are just one example. And then, of course, there's this guy. For years, former U.S. President Donald Trump has complained about a never-ending witch hunt against him. He continues to misuse the term and is always the victim. We are spending millions and millions of dollars on this continued witch hunt. An appalling distortion of history that trivializes the plight of so many women still suffering today. Vinningen prefers a more sober approach to its dark past, one that honors the victims of witch hunts and brings them back into the conversation. All this delving into the history of our family witch has been enlightening and emotionally exhausting, surreal to retrace her footsteps 
and unbearably sad to think so many suffered her fate. Even more upsetting is the fact that women are still going through it. Witch hunts aren't only a phenomenon of centuries ago, but rather an urgent problem that affects thousands of vulnerable women every day in Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. The deadly chain of events instigated by envious neighbors in Margarita Kruber's case is a pattern that keeps getting repeated in life and online. The victims, their pain, their suffering, deserve our awareness and respect. Certainly a strange feeling to be here. It's a good thing that they've been vindicated or at least recognized historically and by the uh, community. What do you think? Do you have a witch in the family? Or perhaps a story you'd like to share? Or would you like to know more about witch hunts? Let us know in the comments below. <laughs>